course, we had uh, minutes that were from back in December, right? We're catching up. They looked okay to me. Um, Anybody have a motion to approve? I think there were 14th of December minutes. Move to approve. Second? Second. Any discussion, amendments? If not all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So voted. Uh, any general public comment before we start addressing the individual uh, cases? I was going to make comment, but Sarah said I'd be able to do it later when Wayne's here. All right, that would be fine. Uh, so first case, uh, request to amend the order of conditions for dock and boardwalk improvements at Fitzgerald Lake to include a boat access platform. Uh, this is, got a nice little picture and a letter that Sarah sent both by email. Uh, and uh, this is Broadway Coalition is the, the applicant, our partner in managing uh, Fitzgerald Lake conservation area. Bob, you want to summarize what we're sure. looking right here? Two years ago, we um, had a big construction project near the North Farms Road entrance to Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area, and we built a new bridge across the stream there and um, renovated the boardwalk and extended the boardwalk and put in a new dock at the end. And we uh, set the height of the dock at 18 inches above the water. And we have found that, uh, I should say that um, a lot of people use the boardwalk of the dock for launching boats. Fishermen and people just out who like to spend some time with the lake. And what we found, or what a, a number of people found, and I found as well, was that it can be very hard to get in and out of a kayak from 18 inches above the water. So our solution to that, we considered many, many different solutions, <clears throat> and um, some impractical, some practical. But what we came up with as best matching the style of the dock and blending in best was to install a platform at one end of the dock, which was only eight inches above the water, which is roughly the height of a kayak, the separate, the three board kayak. And, um, <clears throat> The extension will be uh, roughly six feet by nine feet. It will be, it will require the sinking of two more four by four posts into the lake, uh, similar to the many posts that were driven in for the lock, for the um, dock extension. Uh, I, I thought the dock, would, the current dock was on uh, helical piles. No, no, we abandoned that. Um, and used uh, four by four uh, pine posts instead. Pine, uh, not pressure treated. It, I think I'm not sure what he used. Um, he should not have used pressure treated, but I'm not exactly sure uh, what he put in. <coughs> and you abandoned the helical piles for cost reasons, or what, what was the? No, the, the idea was to uh, mount the structure on the helical piles at, at one time. Yeah, and that I remember. And uh, we, we decided that that was too expensive a solution, really, uh, and unnecessary. And the bottom is such that um, the 4 by 4 is going to be driven in, I wouldn't say easily, but um, the carpenter who worked on the job, Paul Thayer, had a crew who we're very good about driving those boats and posts in. Right, now you're describing it, you're going to do it from canoes. And yes, it was done from canoes. It was wow. Oh. Kind of a funny scene in a way. <laughs> so <laughs> it'll yeah, be... Uh, sledgehammers falling backwards <laughs> in the water. And yeah, they had very good balance. <laughs> yes. And um, so the, uh, the decking on the extension will match the decking on the dock. It will look in all ways similar to the dock, so it will blend in uh, nicely to what's there already and allow people much easier access into their kayaks. And uh, why not uh, a floating extension? Uh, just uh, mm -hmm. attached but on guides rather than uh, permanently fixed? First, the problem with floating docks is that you have to remove the engine. Uh, right or else they get frozen in. And um, 
this would be an awkward place to have to haul a photo dock out and move it back onto the, the mainland. So uh, that was one of the solutions that we considered. I mean, we did go through a lot of different options and uh, decided on one that would match nicely for the dock that's there. There will be one step between the 18 inch dock and the 8 inch dock. So that's for safety. It gives a little more room out there. I've been out there where it's a little crowded. If more than two boats are coming and going, so you'll have, so this dock will, in essence, ex expand the square footage. It, it, it would alleviate that problem. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So so now, I mean, people will be able to uh, particularly get into canoes easily from the front of the dock or the left side of the dock, but people with kayaks are a little trouble uh, with Standing that 18 inches above the water, we'll be able to use the lower dock. We probably, probably a couple of people at one time could use the lower dock, uh, using the different faces. So, what what is the variation in the wa the water level in the in the lake? Is well, that's something that concerned us a, a couple of years ago. Uh, as you may remember, we had a lot of trouble with the water level in Fitzgerald Lake because the uh, drainage pipe at the end, the dam end of the, of the lake was constantly getting clogged up by beavers. And the way it was constructed, it made it very easy for beavers to clog up the whole thing. And that caused the water level to, raise, to rise as much as 15 to 18 inches. This was three and four years ago. But um, the guy who does um, beaver control work for us, Mike Callahan, came up with a, a very ingenious solution. The city put a, a chain link fence around the dam drain roughly three years ago. And the beavers figured out how to get under that and clog up the drain again. So Mike said, well, let's just get on a trap rock and pile it around the bottom of the chain link fence. Mm -hmm. And that's indeed what we did in, I think it was in 2015. And we had a whole bunch of people out there carrying crab walk over to the dam, and we, we put in something like 10 tons of crab walk around the, the base. And it has held, it has worked ever since. There's been no variation in the uh, height of the lake that we're aware of. Except sometimes after a really heavy rainstorm, we can get a little back up. But that's not due to real blockage of the dam by um, beavers. So beavers can be beaten. <laughs> well, <laughs> temporarily. Yeah, yeah. We hope so. It's pretty they haven't figured this one out yet, but right, right, right. they'd have to th be a long tunnel under it. Because right. the trap rock, as I recall, tapers It tapers off, yeah. So and there's a lot of it there. There's no real danger of the, this section being flooded over. We don't think so. We've, we've watched it now for, for, for three years, actually. And we've seen practically no variation in the lake level. I, I will uh, say that at a place uh, that I'm part of in Vermont, um, we, had, we did put a, a, a floating dock in with a 30 year guarantee. We never take it out, but it's, it's a more expensive, more mm -hmm. plastic kind of. Uh, uh, unit that oh, is, uh, I see. Yeah. Uh, made for the purpose, and so yeah, it, it gets frozen in and we use it to sit down to change into ice skates uh, in winter. But it's it's there. Oh, that's, that's so, uh, yeah. It is possible to leave it out there, yeah. but uh, you're right. The, the normal ones that are uh, like the, the blue barrels underneath, uh, mm -hmm. that, yeah, those will get distorted and breaking off. Mm -hmm. The barrels are going to have to haul it out onto the Existing uh, Any other questions from commissioners? Wait, what will the posts be made out of for this part of the project? Not pressure treated, right? No, but four by four pine. Okay. Yeah. How long will that last, do you think? You know, that, that's a good question. I don't really have a good answer for that, but um, from the 
All I can do is judge from the, the boardwalk, which was put in 20 years ago. Okay. And that, the end of the boardwalk was flooded for several summers in yeah. you know, 2013, 14, 15. And it withstood it. And okay. um, it really held up pretty well. I'm not sure whether that was pressure treated or not. I mean, that, that was long before my association with it. Well, if, 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 to the extent that wood stays wet, it won't rot. Right. Uh, it, yeah. It's the cycling. So kinds of resonance wood. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that helped, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So, um, my pessimistic guess would be 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, my optimistic guess would be a bit longer. Yeah. It's really okay. Good. So. Um, yes. so, Sarah, does this count as a hearing that we have to close? It does. Okay. So, motion to close the hearing. So moved. And second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So voted. Uh, and so, what do people think it looks fine to me? And the minimum impact. Uh, two four by four posts uh, not with a provision that they not be pressure treated um, wood. and so someone want to make a motion to grant the uh, amendment of the existing order of conditions so moved and a second second and any further discussion all in favor aye Okay. Thank you. Good luck. Yeah. Get busy. It seems like a good idea. I haven't, yeah. I haven't been out there. Well, I've been out there to walk, but not to bring a, a kayak. Or a, canoe, so, uh, a lot of people use it. Yeah, it's just yeah. amazing the, the boat traffic. <laughs> yeah. The boat traffic. Um, next topic is. Uh, well, we're three minutes short. Anything else we can do? Uh, one quick thing. Um, the seed collection for the Botanical Garden Seed Exchange. So we allow staff to approve things that are scientific and don't allow any collection. So we're, we're today, for example, I approved a, an invasive species, not invasive, um, endangered species survey in Fitz Pasture at Fitzgerald Lake, but that's just going on to see what's there. But the Botanical Garden and Smith would like to go out and collect some seeds for their seed exchange. Um, so the Botanic Garden of Smith College participates in an international seed exchange program where we offer seed from native plants along with seed from plants and cultivation from our outdoor and conservancy collections. Uh, I collect seed by a permanent holly bog owned by the Nature Conservancy and the five colleges and provide an annual report for TNC as part of the permit process. And we would be happy to provide a summary for the city of Northampton as well. And then there's an article about seed exchange and how it works and how cool it is. And this is from the, the plant house people? Yes. Or the, the yeah. Sounds fine. You yeah. need a vote of the commission? Yes. The chair will make a motion that we approve Smith's uh, request to collect seeds. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So voted. Uh, still got one minute, but I think we're close enough. Uh, request for an order of conditions to amend an order of conditions uh, for the crew house work at Smith College. And that was also, Sarah sent a uh, picture of a uh, letter making a request. Uh, wanna Summarize what we're sure looking yeah. at here. So yeah, just prior to the first year design group, um, I, I bought it a year and a half for this, so part of those plans is communication. So the plans you're looking at are what we've got. Um, essentially, what they're trying to do is provide an accessible route to the dock, the existing dock in front of the boathouse. <laughs> um, there is no walk there currently. They're looking to pave it, um, so there's a little bit more impervious area. The only area that we are in here is floodplain, um, and so. Due to the ramping up of the walkway, there's a little bit of, of building up that we need to do some pet story storage calculations that we need to do. It's about 45 feet, cubic feet in all. And so as a result of you know the need to compensate for that area, we're X 
excavating out is a small area further uphill. Um, but otherwise, it's it's generally um, pretty minimal in that. And this will be because you've got the zigzag ramp right. coming That's down. That's further right. And further will this connect to yes. So this will now be kind of get accessible. Exactly. Exactly. All the way down. down. Yep. So it disconnects with the, the existing. So the building that's in the upper right hand corner is yep. a crew house. Mm -hmm. So it's up and left or right of that where the ramp comes down now yep. in the bank. And there's a there's an accessible walk behind the building, behind the crew house between that between the building and the and the bank, which is where that walk leads off to. Okay, so it's gonna connect to this walk? That's that's a dock. Oh. That's a dock. Okay. okay. Yes. Paradise Pond is in the lower right hand corner. Right. Okay. So that's actually a dock that is that is in the water. All right. And Smith doesn't actually use these for crew anymore. When you, Thirty years ago you there was boats in there, but there were shells in there. Not currently because the new standard is eight oars and they don't even fit in the building. Right. And even in the four oar boats that were in there originally, you like ten strokes and you gotta put the brace on. So yeah. uh, kind of a small pond. But there is some talk about getting some uh, four uh, oar machines in there and for training. That comes right. in to teach, not to actually yeah. train yeah. uh, those birds for that. Um, but what this sidewalk will do is make not only the dock accessible, which is when the boathouse is closed, students use the dock all the time, so one of all the students can have access to that. But there's a the sidewalk between the boathouse and the crew house will be more of a diagonal line. Um, there's only about a two inch difference in elevation there. And so once you're in the boathouse, you are uh, accessible to the docks. But when the docks, uh, when the boathouse closed, you don't, you don't have access right. to the docks. And so that's what this sidewalk would do. And the timing is such that <clears throat> we're done with the crew house, more or less, and we're about to pull out the construction road. Once we pull out the construction road, we come back in to put in this sidewalk, we just mess everything up. So we thought, okay, we gotta do it now. Wow. Um, it's a separate project, but it'll be the same contractors, same everything, uh, different fiscal year, so a different pool of money and should I say. It's an extension of the crew house project, but it's really a different project. Understood. Other questions from commissioners? And Sarah, you know, new recommendations you're talking about new plantings. The uh, communication plantings for the previous project were based on the square footage of disturbance. The so this increases it slightly. Yeah, it makes sense to add like, a few of those plantings. My sense is if they thought about this in the original, we would have approved it long ago. <coughs> but we might have. Are there uh, additional? Uh, mitigation plantings that uh, uh, has that been thought about or where they might be? Not in the context that you're asking the question, but um, so we had a planting plan mm -hmm. from Berkshire Design and then through the course of the project, uh, the Botanic Gardens got very interested in what exactly was going to go and they always do. And in the end, I took a credit on the landscaping subcontract and we bought more plants. So there's actually planted quite a few more plants totally irrelevant to this, but um, the obvious difference is uh, there's a large uh, grouping of uh, uh, sumac ground cover between the old concrete stair that goes directly to the boathouse mm -hmm. and the new stair, which is, goes directly to the dance studio. And uh, we added a bunch of birch trees in there. Um, and that's the most obvious difference. We added um, a couple of the small there's a couple of these small trees, yeah. I don't remember. Uh, but most of the planting that we put in it is uh, uh, non woody There's lots of herbaceous stuff. Mm -hmm. We did talk about, there is a new tree, I think it's a magnolia, does that sound like the mm -hmm. old house in the crew house? And mm -hmm. we talked about putting another tree in that area, so I could not object to that condition being added if you, if you want to do that. Well, it's not a, 
a huge additional area of disturbance. Um, um, but uh, and so you may be exceeding your plan already. It sounds like um, from the last <coughs> permit. But, uh, I don't know if other commissioners have opinions about any specific uh, mitigation we might want to uh, require. Curiosity question, the, 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 uh, the house up to the right, I don't know which is the boathouse and which is the crew house, but the one used to have water, we used to be able to. The crew house is two stories and the lower level, and the dance studio is above, and that's the one we renovated, and the space below is, I call it a wet garage. It's There's a, four garage doors. Still there. Okay. Three boats it's in. Still yeah, they, they actually refer to it as an eight bay. You have basically have two boats that fit into each garage door, but there's four garage doors. Okay. <clears throat> Anybody have concerns that we should require specific or just leave it uh, to the judgment of the applicant to uh, uh, add something. I, my, my guess is that um, we would have, if this were all bundled in the original application, uh, we might have requested a, 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 some additional uh, plantings, but it wouldn't have been substantially different than the plan that they already have, which it sounds like they're adding to uh, just seven degrees. But I'm happy to say we should also require some. I agree with your approach. Um, and it sounds like they're already exceeded um, planting by having it now. Any other questions? Permits? There were no invasives in that. Mm -hmm. In the original? Oh. In the slope or in the. Well, I imagine in the slope there is. The slope was riddled with invasives. Yeah. 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 And that was one of the reasons that planting got expanded is that the eradicators made it was really good. The shade of mouth. Right. The, yeah. In fact, the choice of the um, ground cover sumac is right. scrub is it, it's very dense as it matures, and so really the shade out a lot of stuff. But there's lots of locusts, and you have lots of Norway. Um, not a lot of, uh, I don't recall if there's a lot of um, Japanese knotweed. I know there is. <coughs> a lot of poison ivy, bittersweet, and black locusts. Were yeah. <coughs> but as soon as you start getting into that, you know, trying to pull them up, it disturbs inevitably you know, disturbs other stuff. Yeah. And and so the plan was to leave the large trees as much as we could, and we actually uh, designed around some of the bigger ones, and then we got to be tearing down the ones that had to come down. From up above, you could see that there was a lot of damage, and the garden said we should take them down. We were considered hazard trees, so we ended up clear cutting the whole thing. So that wasn't the intent. The intent was to try to leave some of the large trees, but it just wasn't. It didn't mm -hmm. work. Yeah. Right. <coughs> and and uh, as it yeah. turned out, we, we, we for, um, to preserve the root structure, we, we uh, had intended to use <coughs> uh, helical piles, which is like a drill bit that goes down in. And um, if you go deep enough, it's sound mm -hmm. structure. But we couldn't get deep enough. There were too many boulders, and then we hit ledge. So we got in 14 out of about 40 something, and the rest was open cut excavation and concrete here. So it would have sliced through all the roots anyway and killed the trees that we were trying to preserve. So the whole thing was just. I have a very long board. And to the south, there's a bench down there. Is that area going to be mowed? Uh, so the area between the pond and the bottom of the slope. But was always mowed, it was always a, a lawn area. And um, there's two switchbacks. First one overcomes 13 feet vertically, so it's 260 feet. There. Um, it's a 5% slope, so it's pretty gradual. And there is a um, bench like construction at the end, but it's tight. So the bench is actually with the run of the land. The second switchback, which overcomes 9 feet from the dance studio to grade has more room, so it's wide this way, and there's a bench between the third and fourth ramp. And then uh, where the fourth ramp more or less ends, there's, I'm calling it bleachers, mm -hmm. but it's basically a gathering place, and the idea is that you can have an outdoor dance performance or something else <coughs> that could be used for classroom, I suppose. And from that point, uh, heading back to, it goes under the addition, because it's pavement. 
Um, and that will be maintained as a, as a loan. So that's, that's the plan. Um, and you can't roll it right now because we have snapping turtle eggs in there. Um, oh, really? Yeah, that was pretty cool. But it's, I've known about it for years, but I got mm -hmm. pictures of um, the turtle laying our eggs. How big is the turtle? Pretty good size. Yeah. Yeah, they actually go far away away sometimes. I was, I, I was impressed at the, the fact that it laid some of its eggs up under the sidewalk along the street. Well, it's where the college lane. Went up and that long, you know, really? really foot slope. Really yeah. yeah. Wow. <clears throat> we had one come down from Brookwood Marsh, about four houses, and went to the back of one of the houses and laid eggs. To lay eggs? Um, I didn't think they would stray that far down. Mm. I wasn't going to argue with it. I don't know what Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh, that's right on the screen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's so cool. That's a big turn. Yeah. <laughs> she was actively like, yeah, right I didn't know. Know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Put signs up so the students are decided to try to feed the turtle. So there's a math professor whose uh, husband is a biologist, and she put up literally eight and a half by eleven things with sticks. Higher dome, you know, and string and said, I know, yeah. Something like, um, that's cool. I don't know what it says. It says something like, do not disturb, but more scientific than that. Gotcha. And then she left her email address. Um, both down below and there's another spot. She wasn't aware of that one. <coughs> it happened later. There's another one over by the... Did you want to see the thing? Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> kind of fun. You want to see the terms? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments from commissioners? With a uh, uh, motion to close the hearing. Someone in the second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And so, uh, if anybody want to make a motion to uh, allow the amendment to the existing order of conditions uh, to allow the work as prescribed uh, and leave it to the uh, applicant to uh, add as much additional mitigation planting as is practical and it kind of sounds like they are already doing that. Uh, be aware of uh, support in extending this uh, amendment. A moment. And a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So voted. Thank you. Good. And for the, for the next item, which is a big Smith project. That is the fourth item, yes. That we're going to continue. Right? Yes. Okay. I'm staying. Okay. Next item. Right on time, request for determination to determine whether resource area boundaries are delineated accurately with this on Ryan Road and Green Bay Apartments. Scale. Probably at the same time as I did. Yep. Um, good evening. Jeff Squire again. Um, so yes, this is a request for determination for delineation of resource areas really just in the western portion of what was the old Willard Gravel Pit on Ryan Road. Um, the plans that you're looking at now really encompass the entire 200 plus minus acres. Um, we're not proposing any work, but we haven't delineated anything else anywhere else on the site other than you know the, the core operation area. Um, so that's primarily what we're looking at tonight. Um, there are, I, 
for you with all the details, but the, the resource areas that we've got uh, out here are BBW, there is uh, Riverfront area, and um, I think those are two. Um, and we've always got that land underwater. Um, and so what we're trying to determine right now is, you know, what was, what was created as part of the gravel operations and what was not. Um, I think, um, you know, knowing the project that, you know, we, we hope to eventually be before you with, um, knowing what that project consists of and what resource areas we're particularly interested in, the boundaries of this pond largely and this these wetlands, especially on the west portion of the site, um, you know, we don't have any issue with. Um, same with um, most of these wetlands on the southern portion of the site. There is a distinction, and that was what the color plan was intended to show, but there is a distinction between what's, you know, BBW down here, what was defined as, as mean annual high water for the riverfront, and then obviously there's land underwater. You know, for, for those portions. So there's a little bit of overlap in, in buffer zones and resource areas. It does get a little bit confusing. Um, at the end of the day, all of this is going to be improved. The stuff that is really critical for you know for this conversation um, is this pond up here to some degree, but especially this the old wash basin and and the operations that that you know that consisted of. So up here, um, I brought a few pictures that I built. Um, I've got these, which would be, these I also sent, and I don't think I have copies for everybody. Um, so I can go ahead sharing that with you. Um, this is just sort of, a, I went through all the aerial photographs that we have access to, um, both through um, that's GIS, but we've also, there's a, um, another online program that takes a lot of digital. Um, Sarah, do you need one? No. Um, and so this, this may help better describe some of these areas. Um, but I'll start in the, um, particularly in this, that. So these couple of images here are this this pond up in the northern portion of the site. This edge, um, and, and again, Ward Smith was the was the wetland scientist who delineated all this. He was going to be here tonight. He had a couple of other conflicts, so um, you know we had we had a couple of conversations just about his opinions. Um, he didn't flag any of this um, specifically because we're not doing any work towards any work to the north of, of that upper sedimentation pond. Um, so we weren't really concerned with that. It's, it's off limits anyway. This southern edge is what this is. So it's, you know, in the operations plan and looking at the gravel pit history, it acted somewhat like a, a sedimentation pond where this large gravel area with stockpile materials would wash off into the, into the pond. There is, you know, I can pass these around, but this is from the parking lot edge, which is clearly a, you know, a, a stone check dam, some something to help control sediment and water. So, um, the the plan at the end of the day is really to restore all of this. So I, you know, I just bring that to your attention only because it's it's part of what's gone on on this property. Um, and so most of this area we anticipate is going to be restored with native vegetation. And, and, um, you know, all of those issues will go away. We're not, um, he didn't delineate the edge of this, the southern edge of that pond either, again, because according to the definition in, in 10.04 of pond, um, there is an exemption for, you know, uh, pits or ponds that were part of active gravel operations within the last five years. So for those reasons, he didn't flag that because in his mind, is, when he's looking at it, he saw that as, as part of a, you know, that's part of a sedimentation pond, that's where the material was stored. It's really hard to delineate where that edge is according to the wetland regulations. Again, we're not really concerned about doing any work up here. Whatever comes in the future is gonna be a, a huge improvement. Um, so again, happy to call that what you want to call it there's obviously land underwater um, but he didn't delineate you know that edge the bigger concern for us is this old wash basin um, and so what this is and you can see in a lot of these um, some of the larger ones but this is really an area 
seven four Right. So this is sort of indicative of what that basin looks like right now. And so what it was is they pile all the gravel in there and wash it down with water pumped from the pond or from you know, the brook, wash it down. It would, this was, the, this was the low point, it would exit eventually down at this end. Um, you can see in several of the images, this one um, is good looking back at the, at the gravel pit. But there's, a, you know, there's a row of Jersey barriers there that they partially used to hold that in. At the, at the, at the let's see, left side and your, uh, no, right side here is where, where it would exit. So this, this channel comes from, exits this sedimentation pond, wraps around the, the, what's you know, now the disturbed area. They've got some stockpiles and bins along this edge. Um, and it feeds into this larger wetland system. And you can see, looking at some of those aerial photographs, depending on the year that you're looking at, that you know, in, in some of those years, it just looks like chocolate running all the way to the, to the wetlands. And so, again, he didn't flag any of this because that was clearly a sedimentation basin. It's just, it's, it's wet, mucky sediment. Um, this channel, he also did flag. That channel, and these were taken you know, during the winter when we did the survey, it, it does have water. What, what, Ward, um, what Ward presumed happened, which is the case in many of these gravel operations, particularly where there's high groundwater, they excavate down, pull out some of the gravel, groundwater comes in, and they just move on to another hole. That was sort of evident all along this edge. This, I'm sure, came after. They just connected it all. There's clearly a delineation between what's BBW and then what's been dug out and now holds water. Um, it's, you know, it's a consistent, 12 feet wide, whatever it is, and it's you know it's a very channelized you know uh, water course that comes out of the sedimentation basin. The southern edge you flag is the wetland. There's clearly a little rise, and it this gets up in the in the flatter you know land further south on the other side of that channel. That was clearly the EBW. It's, it's a higher elevation, but where it was excavated out of the channel and the water. We're not expecting or anticipating that we're going to do anything to that channel. There's nothing really to do with it. Um, it just, it's too complicated, there's no reason to. What we're really interested in is making sure that this old sediment wash basin is a resource area, and then really where this land underwater or wetland tail begins. Because, again, it's um, in some of these pictures, passes around this, this is a pretty good one. This is, this is really what the, that, that upper end looks like right now. So there's a little bit of water in there. It's primarily Phragmites. You know, when, when it dries out, it's dry. Um, it takes sediment from um, the parking lot and other areas, but that's really where that channel, the overflow starts. And so what, you know, for us to really restore this, it means some extent, you know, improving that and you know, picking a line where where we can agree that you know this channel is land underwater, it's, it's whatever it is. So, for the same reasons, he didn't flag any other stuff. He didn't flag that because of you know the way it's described in, um, in the wetland regulation. Um, and you know, his his opinion is it's it's not his decision really. It's you know it's the commission's decision as to where where they want to draw that line. And I, I don't disagree. It's, you know, sort of in your hands as to what you want to call them. Um, and so that's that's really, again, we're not really anticipating any issues up here. Whatever we do is going to be an improvement. Um, we're not really touching. We'd obviously, we're going to be in Buffalo, we're going to be in River Pump, but we're going to be anticipating that you know, we're surely comply with all the regulations um, and standards. But it's really, you know, this, this is a pretty disturbed area. There's a lot of, you know, banks that are cut into, that are bare. Um, you know, to really restore that, it you know, it means getting into this that tail end of that of that channel a little bit. And so that's just you know, before we get too far ahead, um, but the part two of too far up front, we just want to make sure that you know. We're, we're and that channel, Sarah, is the the area that you're thinking should be flagged before we. Yeah, I mean the actually, the upper portions there. Is, there clearly seems to be a line where it's been recently used as part of the gravel operations and where it was initially dug out and then just left alone. 
two years ago. I mean, no, the, the picture that I sent uh, was the more southern one. And, and, and that doesn't look in any way like it's part of ground operation. The, the, that was just a weapon. Or yeah, but, but that area was not flagged. So it, it seemed right. like one should go out and figure out exactly where it is based on the gravel use. And so where specifically that water field pitch, it was listed as a water field pitch. Yes. That looked like uh, a resource area. Well, that's that so much. Right, and that's yeah. that's what I was. That, that's what this leads into. And but it looks like more than five years. I mean, that's been well, there. Uh, yeah, I, this has been there for longer than five years. But the question is whether this was constructed to facilitate the gravel operations. And so that's that's where this distinction becomes is that you know this this channel in Ward's opinion was dug out because this is all wetland this is higher this is higher elevation to the south so if you look across that swale to the south it grades higher but it's all BBW behind it there's clearly an, an edge you know there's a there's a you know very distinct bank as you can tell in the picture that both Sarah sent and some of these that is very you know, where that bank edge is is very clear um, it's you know it's it's a consistent 12 feet wide for the entire way and uh and this is bbw this is the gravel pit on this side and so for those reasons that's why he didn't fly it it's because in his opinion it was constructed to facilitate drainage of that wash basin because they had nowhere else to put that when water came out here there was nowhere else to go they dug a channel along this wet edge that used to be i'm sure wetland and just delineated that with a channel and just connected it downstream, you know, wherever they could. And so the, uh, the, the, the technical question is, if that was constructed as part of the uh, gravel operation, mm -hmm. even though it hadn't been touched in more than five years, mm -hmm. it was functioning as a downstream element of the active operation. And it does, so there's an interpretation question. Does that mean it doesn't count as a wetland, it, or does? And that's that's why I was I, I, backing up to what I was saying earlier is that we don't anticipate that we're going to change that channel at all. We don't we don't expect we're going to do any work to land on the water. We're not going to disturb any bank. But it could be flagged, and so we could we yeah. I mean, we could certainly go out and flag it. I mean, the edge is pretty clear. But I mean, that's a boundary. That's uh, we can. Yeah, that's that's forest protection. Yep. And there's but, a point where it seems like the active gravel operations clearly end. But it's and really the, yep. and the resource area begins. I mean, that that wash basin is not a wetland. Absolutely not. Right. And you're you're talking about further down. Yeah. Where the, yes. Yeah. Right. And so that's what I and, and talking with Ward, his expectation was they just dug this channel to connect you know the lowest points on the site, and that's that's where the water went. And so it's, you know, to us, what's really critical is, is this, you know, head end of it, the, you know, the headwaters of this channel, where, you know, whether that's BBW, um, if, it, if it, we just, you know, if you establish a line that is, you know, here's where a bank is or whatever we want to call a resource area, that's, that's fine. But it's really, you know, if this is now going to be, you know, a couple hundred square feet of wetland, then that's, that, that's going to be a big deal for, you know, for any restoration project. So, and uh, Jack and Sarah, when you were out there, that area does, it looks like a functioning wetland now. It I, has hydric soils, it has wetland plants, and it's like that. The, the channel and some associated areas around it definitely do. I mean, I, I don't know exactly where I would put the line, um, but the area that I sent the picture of definitely appears to be wetland and it's not fine. And it hasn't been. No one's been near it probably 60 years or so, right. except for we've seen it in the wash water. Right. And so, do I understand correctly that there's an interpretation question? If it's, uh, we can decide to interpret, or maybe we can't, but it, it, it seems like the question on the table is, um, if it hasn't been uh, a part of the operation, where they dump gravel, they wash it off, they move stuff around, uh, but it was just a downstream element. Even though it was created at some you know, generation or two ago, um, 
if it's not really being dis on, on an ongoing way disturbed, it just is a channel for water to flow, uh, is it up to us to decide whether that falls under the exclusion um, for being part of an uh, active uh, gravel operation? And I asked DEP for guidance, and they said this language is really all you have to go on. There's That's a, it. There's no additional fee on The following human-made bodies of open water shall not be considered ponds. Individual gravel pits or quarries excavated from upland areas unless inactive for five or more consecutive years. When did they cease operation? I know that there were gravel washing operations going on as late as, what, 2016? Yeah, 16. I mean, some of those pictures are... Yeah, 16. And would, would active be just receiving wash water? Would we call that active? I mean, based on what it looked like, I, I wouldn't think so. I mean, there's a, there's a part of the wash basin that was clearly excavated and used and was manipulated consistently until the gravel pit stopped operating. Mm -hmm. But that lower channel isn't doesn't fall under that same class of data, I would say. Yeah, I think I'd be inclined, uh, and I, I, I wouldn't out there, but I, I think I'd be inclined to say if it's a, a passive recipient of activities that are upstream from it, um, and it otherwise looks like a functioning weapon, then we would probably want to have it flagged. Mm -hmm. We don't know yet what the project you're preparing for right. is, so we want to have that so in the future, so that when we say, yes, this is a, uh, a, an accurate delineation of boundaries, we then can work from that whenever you come back. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, I guess that's, you know, alluding to what I was speaking about before. What I anticipate will happen is he's going to flag it similar to what happened down here, which is, I think, where you're talking about, Sarah. So what he did is he flagged BBW coming down and then sort of bisecting that swale where there was enough vegetation, enough to separate it from you know, either pond or river or whatever it was going to be called. So there's a, there's a, you know, an intersection of resource areas there. So what he would do is, I think, flag, in my conversation, would be flag, you know, either side of that stream bank as bank. Um, and then anything, you know, inward of that would be land underwater. Everything outside would just be buffer zones. It's just, again, what does this become? And what I, right here? that's that's right and that's where that's where my biggest concern lies is if all of a sudden it ends if if he's going to delineate it like this yeah. and then the wetland's going to come across and then wrap around this head end of it we're going to have you know 500 square feet or so of bbw up there that you know i know we're going to end up disturbing because of a result of the you know improvements that we're trying to make but i don't i don't think it would extend that far I mean, there's piles of gravel there's it's just quick growing plants you, and things like that stuff. You get the tail end of the flag, right? No, he didn't, he didn't flag any of that. What's this no. little portion here? That's that was that was the water level at that time. No, when it looked like right, right here with the flags on. That's your that's wetland on that side. That's the very end of it, right? Does, does well, it wrap around like this. No. This this dark line on the plan. Yep. That for about. A quarter of an inch thick, eighth of an inch thick on the plan is really the channel. That's that's all that is. It's BBW on the other side of it. So that BBW that you're looking at is on the other side of the channel and is, is separate from that. It also appears that it's probably just the section of the the, uh, the ditch that's that's in the wood. It looks kind of wooded on on your well. There's there. Yeah, I mean, this is a great older photo. Yeah, yeah. that clearly shows separation. I mean, this, this end is really where we're interested in. This is, you know, it's filled with, you know, cattails and frag bites and has a lot of the, you know, characteristics of a wetland. And talking with war, that's, okay. you know, if he were to be, um, you know, overly conservative, there would be a little, you know, circle of, of BBW at that end. And this is this is the picture of those people. Mm -hmm. That's that's what that is. And so at some point, this would run into that channel, and there would be a separation between BBW and bank and/or land underwater. 
but if it's if it means that you know all of a sudden we can't disturb this little tail end, even though it's not getting any more water, it's, it's just, it means a whole new level of you know of permitting and, and project work. <coughs> Yeah, I guess if you're looking for us to essentially approve your delineation, you know, and this is the building blocks of your project and your permitting, it could be critical to iron that out and get our perspective mm -hmm. and get that delineated. And again, going back, I don't, I'm not disputing the edges of that bank, the, the channel. We don't anticipate that we're going to do any work in that at all. Same with this upper sedimentation pond. Um, any work to go on there other than just reading out some of the piles and storing them. Um, it's, it's really, you know, an effort to clean up you know, the, a lot of the excavations. The 2015 photo shows basically that at least one side of it wouldn't be considered well when the side that starts the active gravel operation. The other side where the water goes right up to it yeah right the other side with the woods um, right it looks a lot more vegetated and yes possibly that's the edge that needs to be flat. yeah I mean this that's you know again the head end of that stream is really what we're interested in that's that's our biggest concern <clears throat> As you can see in these images, I mean, several years it's dried up, other years it's, it's got water coming right out of the, out of the wash basin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't have as much experience with this as staff does, but uh, it seems like the tailings from the, that wash area goes part of the way around, but it appears different in that ditch area. It doesn't have the same color, doesn't have the same soil deposits. It looks like a different quantity of water almost. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the tailings go that far. I mean, I don't know exactly where I would put the line, but I don't think it's where it's shown currently. Which line? The, the, that, the boundary of the well is in that area. Well, I mean, he, he didn't flag, all he flagged was what was on the other side. He didn't flag the channel. He didn't flag anything around it, just because he wanted to get, you know, have this conversation first. Get your, get your opinions, and you know, if you want to flag that as bank, then you can certainly do that. To pick those up. You can call it that. <clears throat> That's fine. So, in the, in the just to make sure, in the 2017 photo, the last of the back. Um, it looks like that channel, um, uh, as, as Mason was describing, um, uh, if this is north, so that's on the uh, southwest mm -hmm. side of the, that channel, it is um, uh, wooded and reverting to uh, natural foliage. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> on the uh, north uh, uh, west side, um, it, there's a lot of what looks like active disturbance. Um, where the bins are. Where the bins are, there's, a, there's uh, clearly a lot of uh, uh, tire traffic that has kept, um, and you know, it looks like it's a, a highly compressed, highly disturbed area. Um, what I'm trying to understand, Sarah, is where in, in this, is it only where, because all of this looks to me like it's um, pretty actively disturbed. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know when yeah, I mean, it, My concern is really just the channel itself. Mm -hmm. The channel itself. Yeah. I was standing behind, when I took that picture, I was standing behind those piles. Down where the bins were, uh, <coughs> uh, like the the brick chips, and mm -hmm. like right? That other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right down here. And so he has. Uh, if this is the channel right here, correct? Channel right, and he has. 
flagged up close to, but he hasn't really. He didn't flag that edge of bank again, just because yeah, okay. of this discussion. So he can certainly go out and flag it. It would essentially be that same. You know, this this was the water line. That was the breaking grade. So I, I'm pretty confident that that's where the delineation would be. But you know, we can right. call so it. The delineation would be along the dark line. Yes. And, uh, right. Yeah. There. Right. But it would seem like it would be on the. Uh, uh, the southwest side of that channel, just based on this picture, it looks like no. This is, this is, this looks like it has been part of the active operation to me from right. this 2017 photo. Right. And this, yeah, the, you're correcting that the, this plan really only shows one line. There's, a, there's another line that, that wraps around, well, just below that to define that channel. <coughs> And then, so the, the question is, if it gets, and see if I'm thinking about this right, um, that once it gets up here, you're bumping, yeah. this is all active, this is all active, this is all active, um, right. and it's just, uh, it, it looks to me like the, uh, uh, the it's, it's that southwest yeah. side that is not yet fully delineated that we would want to see as delineated. Um, and uh, Jeff, I'm understanding that your area of concern is sort of right just below the wash The wash right. <clears throat> and that that does look like it's reverted to natural foliage in the same way that it has further downstream. I, I guess I, I'd want to see it. Well, that's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what that image is. That's, that's that spot. Yeah, I mean, I guess Warren should just figure out where he thinks that line is. I mean, there's an area where the, the vegetation that is there is fast growing and probably has come up within the most recent five years. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the aerials, you can see the, the boundaries uh, north of those two uh, like trucks, I guess, the changing. Mm -hmm. It's clearly the I, yes. I wouldn't call that a big one at all. And you're talking about just beyond the bins with the chips. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really it's really where that distinction is. Right. Yeah. If you look at the, the series of aerial photos, um, two thousand and eight it isn't wooded up quite as far as it is uh, in two thousand and twelve. Mm -hmm. um, and then from two thousand twelve on it looks like yeah. it's pretty consistent. Yeah. But I guess before we vote on saying yes, these are accurate uh, wetland field deviations, I, I, I agree that we want to see some effort to delineate right up to that edge, wherever that edge is. It looks like it probably is the channel itself. And then once it gets up to where the channel meets the wash mm -hmm. area, there's a judgment call to be made. Um, and where does it look like uh, there's been active uh, disturbance in the last five years due to the operation of the quarry, and uh, where can you say with some confidence that it's more than that? Mm -hmm. I, I, mean, I guess for our purposes, if we can come away with some understanding that, you know, what we hope to achieve is some line in here that delineates the bank or whatever we may call it, and that this head end he may, you know, what, what Ward's concern is, is he flags it as wetland and then we talk about what it is because once it's flagged and memorialized, it sort of becomes wetland and a bigger deal than not flagging. That's, you know, his experience. So, you know, he would not flag it at, at, at our preference, probably. If, you know, if he's not sure and he would call that part of the gravel operations, he probably wouldn't flag it. I think, you know, if, if we can all agree that that makes sense, then I can simply ask him to go out and, you know, with his... Yeah. Well, there's, there's got to be a professional judgment right. in there somewhere because <clears throat> the language that we're well, using isn't clear enough understood. to give clear. Yeah. Which is why he didn't flag it to begin with. Right. Yeah. Right. For this for this very reason. It's better because, to add it than take it away. Right. Right. You're not going to be able to take take resource areas away. So that's why he didn't flag any of those ones that I was talking about tonight for those very reasons. Yeah. And if you what you were hoping to get was just an understanding from this meeting about where that edge might be, just to continue with your planning purposes, you could withdraw the RDA and include mm -hmm. the boundaries in an NOI. 
in an enterprise. Rather, rather than continuing this as sure. a point for Yeah, area. I think it was, I think it was having some comfort level that we can restore this, that we don't necessarily need to delineate it, that that is the water edge, it's that, you know, stone berm that's there. You know, he can, he can go out and flag it, but there really probably isn't much need to just given what we anticipate. So, um, and that this wash base in particular isn't, you know, wouldn't be considered a resource safe. Sure no, no, that's you know, pretty clear. That's that, right. That, that's clear and but I hate to assume. the berm is clear <laughs> and it's just that yeah, we need somebody's professional yep. judgment about what looks like it's been part of an active operation and it disturbed as such and sure. where has this just been a passive wetland receiving uh, mm -hmm. flow from that up in there. So, do so you want to do what Sarah suggested? So I think, yeah, I mean, I think if, if everybody's With okay, that's probably what we would. I guess are the choices at this point. Can we withdraw the request? And Could we keep it open and request a continuance? And then I just want, I want to talk with sure. the board. And yeah, that's sure. Right. That makes sense. Sure. sure. There's no, nothing about this thing. So uh, continue for, we have a meeting in two weeks, but uh, uh, we could continue longer than that. Is that enough mm -hmm. time? No, we should be able to. No, in time. Yeah, two weeks. Uh, is there a motion to continue for this RDA request? Until the next meeting. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 10 minutes for and, uh, um, this is uh, a notice of intent for management activities along the Connecticut River uh, at Smith College and we are deciding to continue that because um, you need uh, um, uh, comments from um, uh, from somebody natural heritage, natural heritage. Natural heritage. Natural heritage. I think we probably already decided to do that because Rosalie's not here. Yeah, I, I talked to her earlier. We can't close the hearing yeah. without the National Heritage Commons, so it's, it's easier just to close it. Okay. So just to continue. Two weeks enough time? Uh, we don't know when they're going to Their deadline to respond is next week. Yeah. I see. So motion to continue the um, Paradise. Uh, Lyman Pond is the little one next to the... Lyman Pond is the little one that's up on higher land. And next Pond next to the plant house. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It overflows into the Paris Pond. Uh, um, so no, uh, motion to continue that case to uh, our next meeting on the 28th. Move. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We'll see you then. Uh, next, uh, endorsement of the open space recreation and multi use trail plan, which uh, she Sarah sent electronically. Uh, she sent the website the, to go to, but we just heard about it. Yeah, right. About a week ago. Right. No, I have, I have not read all 147 pages. I haven't read any of them. I see you downloaded it. Like I said, it was about 147 pages. Sure. So um, it's 147 pages, and there's probably 14 pages that you really care. Yeah, I, I read the last one seven years ago. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so mostly it's this word and word. Right. Mm -hmm. About a third to half of the plan is just the inventory. And this is really boring, but it's the, the institutional memory. So it's every deed, every title, uh, insurance policy we have, every stewardship plan. So it's really just to keep track of all those things. The goals and objectives, the big picture goals and objectives are taken right out of the city's comprehensive plan, so we talk it over. The demographics were virtually unchanged from seven years ago, except for a few months. So most of that stuff isn't changing and doesn't really set policy. There are 14, 11, 11 pages that are the action plan. And so that's really the part that I want to talk about, and that's really, in essence, what we're asking you to do endorse in the process. 
So everything else is really just the inventory stuff. Um, it, we have 12 actions, most of which don't affect the Conservation Commission, but I want to walk you through them all quickly so you know what it is and then spend more of the time on the, the three or four actions that, that are there. So I'm just going to walk you through. Oh, so most, I can't remember how many of you were here. When we kicked off the process, we met with you all early fall. Um, and sort of went over a lot of this and hasn't changed dramatically through then. We had um, two formal public hearings. We've met, just as so we met with you, we've met with other boards. We had a hunting forum in Florence and Leeds. We had a rolling forum along the bike path taking testimonies. We had, we had a, um, uh, a survey online, the Friends on Hanky Trails and Greenways did that bike paths. We had a mapping piece, so it's a uh, interactive wiki mapping so you can go on and mark things. So we have lots of different ways to collect information in the process. We had a good long conversation with city council and we presented it to them, which I'll go through in a second. So we had lots of input. I would say literally 95% of the comments we had were about. Um, people were strongly divided and everything but hunting, it was really a clear consensus and so the comments we had were incorporated in the plan. So without exception, things that people said were incorporated. Um, hunting is really the main area where it just, there was not a consensus that's out there. So I'll, I'll go through that. And of course, the nature of, you know, you all are the ones who adopt regulations or don't adopt regulations about hunting. So the nature of the plan is, to the extent we could build consensus, we put in the plan. To the extent we couldn't build consensus, we pull back to plain vanilla that doesn't say much other than recording what we heard and then throw the ball back in your court. You know, because the plan's not, you know, it's not really useful in this process when you have to decide and, and doesn't make sense for the Recreation Commission or for the Ag Commission to opine or something as controversial. So that stuff is here, and I'm going to spend some time on it, but it's not, there's definitely that much about it. Um, so this is the part, the first few slides where I presented almost verbatim when I was here before, so I wouldn't spend a lot of time, but you all, you know, so. The last time we did a plan was seven years ago. We've been spectacularly successful in lots of things the last seven years. We went from, this is the last 10 years in terms of this one, but in the last 10 years we've gone from 15% of the city protected as permanently protected as open space to 25% of the city. That was as of last summer. We're now a little bit higher than the 25%. So very successful there. You can see 25% of the city is permanently protected, 20% is managed for conservation. That's not all you because that includes fish and wildlife land and state land, but the, the vast majority of that for conservation land is you guys. And so you can see here, we've been buying a lot of land, it's been going up year to year, we have ups and downs, but really starting um, in the late 80s or early 80s, we started going up dramatically. Ups and downs basically in usual years. We're now buying about, on average, about three quarters of a percent per year of the city as permanent protected open space. Three quarters of a percent every year, obviously, starts adding up. Um, so very successful there. To these, you can't compare scales here, so you, but with any scale you can compare time. So parks land, we basically had done almost nothing. We had a couple of small acquisitions. Um, actually, it's what's on here, you don't see the date, but you know, the biggest acquisition is um, these very small pieces. We haven't bought any big pieces of land. Depending how you classify it, the Playground and recreation area instead of Bridge Street School. The city's owned as a property for years. We transferred it from general city ownership to park ownership. And likewise, Ellerbrook Field, which is actually a recreation area, it has been owned by the city for years and we transferred it. Doesn't make a big difference. It makes us eligible for grants and makes it impossible for us to sell it. So those were acquisitions, but again, they didn't change the ownership. So parks weren't going to change. Recreation, for years after doing nothing, we more than doubled the system. So Florence Fields is 24 acres, and it basically was everything else combined. And Connecticut River Greenway, I've got the exact acreage, about six acres. Again, a major expansion. So, you know, really major expansions over time. Conservation is the most dramatic story, again, starting about 1989 going up dramatically, CPA, sort of over here, going up dramatically again, again from that. Um, and then agriculture, again, not, nothing happened until we got an agriculture preservation restriction. So this is preserving ag land, not necessarily owning it. So nothing happened until we got an uh, agriculture preservation restriction on the state hospital in 1989 or 1990. And then some additional, some of these are small acquisitions that are part of bigger conservation areas. 
10 acres of mineral hills. We own 1,000 acres of land, which is 10 acres of farm. Um, and some are agricultural preservation restrictions. Some in, in partnership with the state, then we bought some, about 100 acres of agricultural preservation restrictions on our own without the state. So we can on that. Uh, may I go back to the next? Okay, right, so this is a map of all the permanently protected open space in the city which the public actively uses um, and which we have an ownership interest in. Okay, so it does not include all of Mass Audubon's property, it doesn't include Mass Audubon property that we don't jointly own with them. We own about 60 acres joint with Mass Audubon, so it includes that, but it doesn't include their property, it doesn't include federal properties doesn't include conservation restrictions, doesn't include watershed lands. The reason to show this is these are the lands that we sort of have active control over, active management over, and the public's welcome to use. Um, and so it's an important piece, again, it doesn't cover everything in the city. Um, again, growing, you know, I like to say we spend thousands of dollars doing good planning for where we should buy land. But to some extent, if you took a map like this, overlaid the streams, overlaid the map tops, and took a big crayon and connected them, that's what we're trying to get. So not really surprising you, we're trying to connect these areas, we're trying to connect these areas, and you know, a little more sophisticated than that, but not that much more when we, when we do lots of overlays. Um, we have in the plan lots of overlays, and they haven't again changed from seven years ago. Um, and the same story for multi-use trails, you know, one of the first trails in New England in 1984, 85, I'm exactly sure where, and then, you know, some increases and traumatic increases in recent years. But then we didn't stop, even though the, the traumatic place came six or seven years ago. We've still been doing little expansions each year that seem little, but again, you know, more than we've done for years over here. Um, so you all know this, I'm not gonna spend time on this, but uh, some of our successes have been how do we manage property? Uh, so that's the air, clean area of yours. We've done a lot, I mean, the area that we're, is, we think we're doing the worst job is managing invasives. So I said this again when I met before you, if you look at our day, if you look at almost every metrics we have from seven years ago, we're doing a better job now than we did seven years ago. If you, if you looked at how much invasives we're treating, we're doing a better job than seven years ago. If you look at how many invasive plants are out there, we're doing a worse job. We're, you know, we're not keeping up. Some of this is climate change, some of this is passed from elsewhere. So we know it's a challenge. So we've done a lot of things in that area, both the city and our various partners, and everyone from Latham to Broadbrook Coalition um, has done a lot of work out there. Um, we do a lot of things, we, we tried to professionalize, we, do. we used to sort of buy land, if we didn't have to survey it, we didn't. We're now going back in time and catching up, so we're in the process of surveying every, surveying every piece of conservation land we have, putting boundary markers up on every single one. We have partnerships that are from very formal partnerships with incorporated groups like Broad Brook Coalition to very informal groups like Friends of Salma Hills, where there's sort of two different friends groups and wonderful partners. There's nothing in writing. So we have lots of those. We now are in our second year of having a half-time person whose job is primarily conservationary maintenance. And there's a little bit of stuff on bike paths, a little bit of other projects my office runs, but probably, you know, of a half-time position, probably 16 hours a week is conservationary. Um, and that's actually more than paid for itself. So we looked at Fitzgerald Lake Dam, for example. We looked at the estimates Time Bond gave us for what it would cost to bring the dam up to snuff. Um, and then Joe Rogers, by name, has been doing a lot of it on a much lower budget piece because we're out there because we can do work. So it's paying for itself and it's letting us catch up. So lots of those things we're being successful about. Um, the other thing we're doing is we're trying to look at every single neighborhood in town. So we had a metrics four years ago, or seven years ago, of having open space within four tenths of a mile of where everybody lives in town. Um, that's basically walking distance. Long walking distance, but walking distance. Um, and the dots on this are people, so there are 28,000 dots if you zoom this up. Um, and the brown is who's within four tenths of a mile of some kind of open space. And you see with very small areas, we've gotten the entire city, and this map was actually done a year or two ago, we've actually filled some of the gaps. It's a little misleading, we have a lot of focus on environmental justice and social equity and who's served, and the fact, so the, the example I often give is River Run Apartments. River Run abuts one of the, a larger conservation area, Connect River Greenway, but if you knocked on people's doors, 90% of them, probably 95% have never been to the river there. 
it's tough to get there. The trustees would not allow us to build a trail there. There's certainly not cultural appropriate sports there. So we've hit part of our goal, and this is more on the recreation side. We're thinking more about what are the other things that we could do. River One, some of you remember, you actually gave us permission to have small community gardens at Connecticut River Greenway as part of that, right? How do we have, you know, as part of this equity goal, the trustees wouldn't allow us to build a trail from their property to our property, so that, even though you gave us permission, that's going on. Um, yeah. So we're doing this, we're trying to work a little bit harder. Doing this. Our new proposed metric you see later is even a shorter distance, 10 minute walking distance, but focused on urban areas. So if you live out here, you're guaranteed going to own a car, and so we don't feel quite as responsible to have an easy walk to a conservation area. If you live in the urban core area, you may not own a car and you don't have any tracts of land, so more of our focus has been you know, from, from those neighborhoods. Um, we've had success. This is less a conservation commission issue, but we've sort of said we care about everything. We care about those thousand acre conservation areas that you primarily focus on, and we also care about the 100 square feet on, on one amber lane or the 20 square feet that's a movable parklet or the you know 100 square feet on <coughs> little parklets we've done on uh, uh, Pleasant Street this year. So we have this, this pavement program, we've expanded it. This one under construction right now behind the roundhouse. So it's sort of, it, it's ongoing process. Actually, we're in construction from this building, and that's really more just a curb extension. Um, parks and Recreation, again, different area than most of you, but there's some overlap. So I, I mentioned two big areas. Connecticut River Greenway was done in partnership with you all. So there's a city, there's a conservation commission, Connecticut River Greenway. Then there's a recreation commission, Connecticut River Greenway Park. And there's a conservation area, Connecticut River Greenway. And it's deliberate. The, the walking trails on your property, but most people are walking it out on motors who are going out there. So we've tried to sum that co-management. Um, the Mill River Greenway and Florence Fields, likewise, they butt against each other. People can park on, on the recreation property and walk on the conservation area property. So there's some overlap in there. So that's just sort of a very quick background. Um, so I want to go through sort of these 12 things. Again, I'm going to spend more time in the areas of, of interest to you. Um, 12, so think of these, these are the actions, you know, the, the objectives, and then we have some sub actions. So I'll, I'll go through them very quickly. But, most of the stuff is things we keep doing. So now that we have planning staff, we hope to keep moving forward on bringing the management plans alive. And so planning staff would go out and do the work the plan authorized them to do. The way we've been doing this for the last seven years, and we keep doing this, is when the plan's clear and says, here's what we want to do, then planning staff does that. Things come up all the time, and we come back to you and say, this isn't the plan. How do you want to interpret this? So um, agriculture, land that, we, that you all own, you've authorized a staff working with the Ag Commission to do those leases. Um, and so it's that kind of thing, you know, Fitzgerald Lake Dam, we don't, I mean, other than needing permits, we don't come before you when we bring a ton of rock to Fitzgerald Lake Dam because we have existing permits for it, and that's clearly in the plan. But it might, so you're not always gonna see the biggest projects or the smallest. It might be a very tiny project that isn't in the plan we have to come before you, but something that's already been in here. So that, that we keep going forward. So one thing we talked about a little bit when I was here in the fall, this is more conceptual, but it always bothers me when people say, Amherst has these great hiking trails, why doesn't North Amherst? In fact, we have more hiking than Amherst does, but they have the Eminem Trail, it's sort of a big more key trail, and so we've thought about a trail that circles around North Northampton, um, you know, nice logo, mostly would be existing trails, it would force us to think about how to connect those trails together, maybe harden the trails, you know, trails of different degrees of erosion, the ones that get heaviest use, the ones that we focus on the most. We've played with, this is totally silly, I know, but we've played with, okay, there's 36.1 miles of, of Northampton, square miles of Northampton, maybe the trail's gonna be about 36.1 miles long. We won't, we won't manipulate the trail, but I just hope it's like what We actually played and laid it out, it came to about 29 miles in different scenarios. That's gonna be a big, you know, so there's some places where the trail will obviously be going through Mineral Hills, and there's lots of places we need lots more public discussion. So we haven't laid it out yet. We actually just applied for a grant last week for doing a bike path through the Birds Bog area, which you all gave us permission when we bought that land. We thought about applying for the Northampton One Trail and decided we needed more community conversation first for the exact location. But, but moving forward to that, uh, invasives going forward on that. 
accessibility. We've now done a lot of big picture marquee projects. You know, boardwalks at Fitzgerald Lake, Gorge Walk at uh, Barron Street Marsh, the bike path where the bike path crosses your property. We haven't paid a lot of attention to some very small things. You know, there's some interest in doing a picnic table on the Connecticut River Greenway. Just making sure the picnic table has wood that extends out to some of the wheelchair and roll under it. So we're just trying to do a little more of this sort of in some ways lower budget stuff now we've done the bigger budget piece. Um, and then more agriculture and conservation land starting maybe with the the what the area next to River Run Park. So all those kind of projects. Um, so then continuing to buy open space. This is the area where the combination with city council is most interesting. When we went before city council seven years ago, there was clearly some councillors who thought, what's the end game? Are we buying too much land? Um, is it devastating the city's taxes? Are we doing all these other things? And we, from time to time, every two or three years, we do an assessment. What's the fiscal impact? It's very minor. We can actually calculate what percentage of people's tax bills are going to lost taxes. And then, of course, a lot of that's offset by higher property next to conservation land. So we're going to continue doing that kind of thing. But what we heard from councillors, so, so seven years ago, we said we want to get 25% of the city for the next seven years. We didn't plan beyond it. And we want to think a little bit about how do we stop the lot prices, building lots from being so expensive that our children can't afford to stay here and that we don't have affordable housing for people who work in our restaurants. We went to council and said, okay, that metrics of how much land you buy, that's not so important. At least in the next seven years, it's not so important because we're not going to get to wherever we want to be someday, we're not going to reach the next seven years. So I'm not sure what someday is, I'm not sure we stop, but we're not going to get there the next seven years. Council was much more interested in these limited development projects and how do we create new building lots. So there are more building lots in the market now than they have been in a long time. It's a peak during the recession, the lots weren't selling. But we have more building lots right now. We passed some zoning to allow a lot of infill development close to downtown. The state hospital obviously still has lots. So land prices are obviously going up. It's expensive to buy a building lot in town, but we don't think us taking land out of circulation for development, for conservation, is inflating it because there's a lot of lots that are out there. So that's really become our metric. We're going to look at it on the side that you don't deal with my office in terms of zoning, where the place is for development. On the side you do deal with, if you remember Burt's Bog, um, we carved off 12 building lots as part of the project. Eight on your land and, and four on land developer. Okay? And so those kinds of projects we're going to keep thinking about. Um, so that, that sort of big change from before, um, still work on big conservation areas. The other thing I, I brief you separately, briefly, I spend more time, we signed at the staff level a memorandum agreement with Kestrel Land Trust. We've had sort of transactional arrangements with Kestrel and with Mass Audubon um, and with uh, Meadow City Conservation. And so we just wanted to more formalize that, particularly with Kestrel, for two reasons, sort of to know what's our relationship with them for the next seven years, and frankly, to lower our costs for conservation restrictions. We were finding the cost of conservation restrictions had gone from not being a significant cost at all to being quite significant for us. Um, and so we had to get a handle on this. And so we did this new arrangement. Again, I'll, I'll give you more detail at some other point, but we did a new arrangement. Basically, our costs for conservation restrictions will plummet in return, we've begun working with friends from Hampton um, Parks and Recreation to lower our costs. We're basically committed to staying in Kestrel or Meadow City or Mass Audubon um, at this much lower cost piece. So that, that's been great for us. Uh, building lots that I talked about, this is just about building lots. How do we find that right balance so we're preserving all the key parts of the land while saying some limited development in some places is a good thing. Um, and then, um, I think seven years ago we said, you know, support this pristine land and conservation areas in people's backyards. So we gave the example of Montview Avenue. Great conservation area. You're not going to drive to Northampton from Boston to go see Montview. I mean, maybe you're not going to drive anywhere from Boston to see. But, you know, we have some amazing conservation areas out there. Montview is really important to serve the neighborhood, but it's not that kind of thing. So we brought this to put in one category all those things that serve people. So if we're primarily the conservation business for wildlife, we still want to serve other things. And so this is the thing I said about, think about open space within 10 minutes of urban neighborhoods. Um, so we already have that four tenths of a mile. What's the next step? Um, keep working on partnerships for trail improvements. We play with green burials in conservation land. We're actively looking at one piece of land that maybe is a good green burial place that brings in more partnerships. Such a green burial? Uh, basically a burial without chemicals, without a vault. 
uh, and you get put underground. Um, and many cemeteries accept it, mm -hmm. and there's I have one Muslim cemetery in Eastern Mass, so it's only Green Barrow, but of course it's a religious thing. So a lot of land trusts around the country have started allowing these Green Barrows. Sometimes there's a simple marking, sometimes there's no marking, but it's not inconsistent with conservation. Some places won't allow a tree to grow in that area. Some places say after a certain number of years, it's fine to have a tree to grow there. Um, and so actually, you know, it's consistent with conservation land and less chemicals in the ground. We played, the quick story I tell sometimes is, we worked with Armin La Palme, who sold us his property at 10 cents on the dollar. Like, you really want to preserve the land. And we worked with him literally for three and a half years to do this deal. Everybody had to be happy. This is a wonderful deal. We all walked away happy. About a week after we closed, he said, I'd love to be buried in the property. Well, once we close, that's a conversion of land. We couldn't do that. He could have his ashes spread if he wants, but we couldn't be buried. So we just want to think about the things up front. You know, now with that perspective, if we were buying that area again, we probably would say the conservation restriction, including green burials being allowed in the property. Maybe we do it, maybe we don't, but sort of it's nice options out there. Um, snowmobile trails, some of you know we have snowmobile trails in two areas. The Bergy Bullets use a trail. Um, on Beaver Brook um, with really no problems that we're aware of and they're great managers. And Turkey Hill Road is open to snowmobiles with lots of problems and I forgive the stereotype, but 14 year old boys who leave the trail and drive through and destroy the woods. And so the suggestion is saying, we say these two historical areas are fine for snowmobiles if we can find management partners. So Burgie Bullets, as long as they're around, continue to allow that trail. Turkey Hill Road, if we can find partners, we'll watch their kids. And otherwise, we start figuring ways not, not to allow it there. Um, we have the same thing about the Jeep Eater Trail. We've had some great partners who maintain it. We've had some problems with Jeeps leaving the, the rocks and going through the mud. And so we want to sort of say, again, you guys have to do a good partnership maintain this property. There's some land owned just to the east where the Jeeps keep going. It would make sense to buy that land. Again, this wouldn't be new use, but to buy that land and better manage it than when we, we don't own the property. Um, environmental justice I've already talked about, sort of how do we serve low-income neighborhoods that are underserved. And then the hunting, the, the hope was in hunting to try to find some sort of consensus. Seven years ago, we plundered off on you all and said, have future discussions. And it was really hard to, you know, it, it was very contentious at the time. So, you know, over time, we sort of had conversations. The, the last one said, said identify places for hunting. Um, in the last seven years, you made some changes, ended hunting in one area that didn't make sense, allowed bow hunting in one area that seemed to make sense, and then the open space plan to say we couldn't really reach the consensus, so we did sort of just a minimal piece. We sort of said there's some areas that we know hunting's not appropriate. Very high visitation, neighbors nearby. It doesn't mean it's appropriate in all the other areas, but at least these areas where it doesn't make sense. We know that there's huge differences. So, Community perceptions, you know, more polarized than any other issue. We don't pull punches in it. I mean, this isn't just about what people want. There was a significant disagreement on the very facts that are out there. Um, and a collaborative consensus building planning process isn't a way to reach agreement on facts. You know, we kept looking for a grand compromise. Ultimately, it's going to come to you guys, and you're going to do research and doing it. So we sort of raise the issues, but if we can't even agree on what the facts are, we certainly can't agree on the excuses. Um, and so we went, you know, sort of go through and highlight that, and then sort of throwing this back to you and sort of saying, you know, this comes back to you, no hurry, you do this tomorrow, you can do this a year from now, before you change your regulations, you need to as a public hearing. Uh, I'm sure you're gonna be hearing from everybody. And these are all things you could do, right? You can totally ignore everything the plan says. It doesn't say much, this is less than a page in the plan. But it's only a plan, it's not, even if you endorse it, it's not, you know, a mandate for you. Um, you can set whatever geographic limits you want. Ban it in some places, allow it in other places. Again, you don't have to do what we said in the last slide. You can have seasonal limits, right? So a lot of people were concerned, oh, there's hunting for something every day of the year. You can say it's only deer season. It's only a week of deer season. It's only raccoon season, maybe not. But you know, you can, you can choose that for both seasonal limits and species limits. Um, and you can think about hunting methods. So when we were trying to find this grand compromise, we asked hunters, you know, does bow hunting make a difference? Um, and the answer is, for the people who bow hunt, it makes a great difference. For the people who hunt the shotgun, they don't. I mean, they tend to be different populations. So it serves one population, it doesn't serve the other population. Um, so lots of debate in this process. I will say the only thing, this is sort of speaking for me personally, this is not the plan. 
the only thing that bothered me, and I know bothered some other people in the process, was sort of the, the lack of respect in the process, right? So we don't, this is not a majority rule issue. We, you know, we allow lots of different groups using different properties. I don't personally care whether you allow hunting or not. I have no dog in that fight. Um, but I do care that we sort of build this, this process. So that's what's that here for hunting. I brought extra pages of that one page if you all want them. Oh, I already printed it. Okay. <laughs> um, so then the rest, I'm going to erase this quickly. Um, so preserving farmland, this isn't really changed from what we're doing, right? So we're, we're being a little more clear. We don't think we should be in the farm ownership business because then we're in the land manager business. We're trying to find farmers. Farmers often want to invest in a very long time frame. And as a city, we're limited how long we can give leases and licenses for. Um, so for the most part, we can farmland should be private land, except it's often part of other acquisitions. So again, 10 acres in the original 88 acres in Mineral Hills, now 10 acres out of 1,000 acres in Mineral Hills. Um, the jail, far, the old county jail, uh, had a working farm until 35 years ago when the county chain moved. That's gonna come to us in the next couple months. Um, so there will be some properties that we own so we're just trying to be clear. Generally, we think it should be privately owned with these few exceptions. And of course, this is really more the Ag Commission than you all, but we don't protect farmland if we don't protect farmers. And this, this is more true in Northampton than in Eastern Mass. There's lots of places in the country where farmland's being threatened by development. Just through quirks, most of our farmland is in meadows, which floods and can never be developed. And most of the farmland outside the meadows has already been protected. Not completely, there's you know, 60 acres of farmland that, that is at risk, but 60 acres out of 4,000 is a small amount. Our bigger risk for farming, and this is an ongoing thing, is land being abandoned. It's, just, it's marginal for farmers, it's marginal for farmers in the market. So this is sort of, even land acquisition and land protection, thinking about farmers is part of this process out there. Um, we played, this is one of our failures in the last seven years, we had this vision of this grand compromise, right? You're not, you technically most of the roads the meadows are private, not technically, most of the roads and meadows are private, and people can call the police and kick you out. Um, that upsets neighbors to no end. The farmers have legitimate concerns about some yahoos who do donuts through the fields and do damage, and even good, responsible owners who let the dogs off leash. Food security plan means they can't use the crops, so the dogs foul. And so we play with, is there some sort of grand compromise, which might be gating the meadows at night, it might be the city maintaining the meadows roads better, not allowing dogs there, um, and then all those roads being open to the public. So far, we've been told failure. But still, in the plan, the Ag Commission, at least representing part of the farm community, supports this. The owners largely don't. Um, so buy more land for recreation, again, less of your area. The only real area of overlap is we want to, at some point we can't buy land, right? It's all been developed, it's all been in private hands. And so we want to think about, we probably have enough recreational land to meet our needs for a long time, but forever is a long time. So Sheldon Field, we've been buying land up, sort of checkerboard pattern, it doesn't even all connect. We just want to connect Sheldon Field, and then we'll keep leasing it to a farmer, but it's there. We could always discontinue it at some point in the future. Um, and then there may be some very small pieces. An old elementary school site that was never developed off Oak Street, it's just growing up um, that kids use for BMX rides and people dump their materials in the backyard. We want to think about that. So there may be some other small recreation areas. We still think about playgrounds. So there might be some small pieces, but except for Sheldon Field, the era of you know buying under 30 acres probably isn't likely to happen for recreation. Uh, here's the Sheldon Field piece. But we own this, it's developed. You wouldn't know that we own that. It's just grass. We own that. So you can see what the gaps are. Um, and then, I'm not going to spend time on this, but so improve the recreation areas. Some are recreation areas in great shape, like Florence Fields, although it needs a final phase. Some, like Mames Field, are very tired. There's some overlap with you there. Mames Field, you may know, partially filled the river, mm -hmm. and so the river wants to come back every so often. So thinking about a rehab to Mames Field also needs to think about a rehab in light of flooding events. Um, and then maintaining existing parks and recreation areas. Um, I wouldn't spend time on this once we want, but continue to expand our rail trails. This is an area we need literally a 30 year plan because we need to identify where the trails are so when development comes forward, we protect that area. So, some of you know we have a trail called Rocky Hill, it goes from Ice Pond to Florence Road. It's in the middle of nowhere, it's not a top priority for a trail. But we did this plan seven years ago, and so when development came forward, we 
got their traffic mitigation was to improve that. So that's why there's a lot of things out here that are far more than we do in seven years. Again, it's just the map, the areas that are out here. Um, continue the downtown, the pavement, unload, you know, unload the pavement to beloved parks. So thinking about that, not mostly conservation areas. There could be some small overlap. We start to think about the historic Mill River that comes through downtown. Is it one of these areas that we can do something about? Um, so there's a little bit of overlap with you, but not a lot. And then the final two slides, but we started this seven years ago in little pieces, continuing to figure out how do we honor history. So um, we did, like some of you know, if you go what we used to call the Manhattan Rail Trail, which we now call the New Haven and Northampton um, Canal Trail, that name change was about honoring this history, going back to what it is. Seven years ago, we put a sign up that had both names on it. Now we've flipped, which is the major name. We got a small grant, $3,000, I think, from CPA, which you all supported, to put interpretation, interpretive signs in some of the conservation areas to, to interpret both the human history and the natural history. So all those kinds of things we want to step up. The biggest one you were involved with, we bought a mine. We don't usually buy lead mines. Um, and we bought it for both conservation purposes, but also to protect this 200-year-old mine shaft and introduce people to it back in them to eat lead. Um, and then generally, thinking about public awareness. Right? So we used to paper maps. We sort of got away from paper maps with the internet. Internet sort of some people, not others. We want to think more about these things out. So um, we've been going through, you know, and we're sort of asking you to endorse the plan if you're ready to do it. Um, it is. We are going to ask the planning board to to adopt it tonight because it's time critical. We just applied for a $400,000 grant, um, and so I had to send a draft plan with the grant. Um, I said the final plan was done. We're about to apply for another couple of thousand dollars of open space acquisitions. So we're sort of at this deadline for the process. Um, questions for me? Questions from commissioners? Is the, is the managed forest land all watershed land? That's why you didn't speak of it. Yes. So conservation, we do always with the option of managing conservation property, and I actually think some places it makes sense, but we have not done a, we have, haven't done a commercial cutting in 35 years. Um, we've cut individual disease trees. You gave us permission, you collectively gave us permission to deal with some of the diseases and healthy trees on Glendale Road, and we do tend to a forest stewardship plan for each thing, but we don't actively manage what people do with us. So, yes. Did you look at the lens of climate change resiliency? We did, and so on the map, basically all the soma, so this is about sort of thinking about as species have to move north slowly, you know, having a beautiful conservation area that's isolated ecologically may not be that useful from a climate change standpoint. So mineral hills and soma hills, the Berks Bog area trying to work on, they all fit within that mapped area. Um, so it, it's definitely a priority, a priority anyway, but it's definitely a priority, it's definitely something to highlight and grant applications. That acquisition, Mass Audubon over Route 10. I don't know if we hit that area. I don't remember. Did we? That was a wildlife corridor. It's definitely a wildlife corridor. So we look at wildlife corridors, even ones that aren't part of the TNC OSI mm -hmm. piece. Um, so, what, yeah, so two, two separate things. So, as you, I should mention, some of you may remember this from before in terms of the actions. We do two things in the plan we identify all the things we want to acquire, basically, we describe in detail. And then we have the kind of criteria we look at and we don't know what's there. So we say, for example, wildlife quarters, we identify some or we know about them, and we don't identify some. So the question uh, before the commission is uh, uh, endorsement of the uh, open space plan. Uh, and I will uh, read the page that specifically addresses hunting, which is the main point of is the only controversial, extremely controversial piece. Um, after going through all of the review processes and various boards and committees throughout the city. Um, and that says, the Conservation Commission should discuss the hunting framework in future public hearings. During the public conversation on this plan, the issue of expanding hunting opportunities on conservation land was the only subject where there was no consensus or compromise in as a result, the plan makes no recommendation about hunting, and the issue remains with the Conservation Commission, which is charged with the regulation and use of the conservation land. So, uh, in fact, endorsing the plan does not take a position on 
hunting. It is otherwise uh, endorsing the broad range of things that Wayne has summarized. Uh, and the, the one comment I'll, I'll, I'll make is, uh, and I remember thinking this seven years ago, and I'm impressed with how much progress has been made, that this is a, a remarkably thorough wish list of many, many things. And um, uh, the, the fact that we're up over 25% of protected land is really pretty impressive. And a lot of that has been in the last seven years. Uh, uh, but if, I, if you look at all, and I, I just surfed through the 147 pages today, um, uh, that if you uh, think about all the things you could wish for, from the face of species removal that the Conservation Commission is involved in, from the face of species removal to uh, expanding public access to, uh, uh, to all the, the uh, things that were under our charter, uh, they're all listed there and they're not prioritized in any particular way. They're just all wonderful things to do. Um, so there's not a lot to, uh, to argue with from my perspective the things that fit within our uh, and the one controversial area, hunting, it doesn't uh, make a recommendation other than that we should talk about it in future public hearings and come to some decision whether or not we want to change current land use uh, regulations. Uh, so it doesn't, uh, endorsing the plan does not um, take a position other than saying, yep, this is a wonderful wish list of many good things. Comments and questions before I ask for public comment? Um, with regard to the hunting, I just wondered if the city solicitor had any input in terms of the city's exposure, if there was a hunting accident where someone was injured or killed, does that expose the city to any type of lawsuit? Because we, yeah. if, if it were allowed, hypothetically. We, we have an operation this time around, but there's this the recreation liability statute, mm -hmm. which you know, we rely on for everything that says if we're not charging, um, we're basically okay. protected. Yeah. This came up, this isn't about hunting at all, but at, some of you may remember Turkey Hill Road, we have an exposed face above a quarry. Mm -hmm. And our insurance carrier has an insurance policy, has a, a grant program to fund things that reduce our liability. And so we said, wouldn't it be great to put up a fence here so people don't fall under future death? Right. And they said, it's a great goal, but recreational liability statute, we think it's complete. Someone falls to death, horrible thing. You may be right. doing your own money, yeah. but then you have no liability. Okay. Not worried about it. Okay. So I think from that standpoint, right. we're okay. not worried from the legal standpoint. Other questions, comments? Well, I'd like to thank Wayne for all his work. I think uh, um, the fact that we do have 25% Space yeah. is hugely significant, and I know Wayne's been a large part of that. Oh, Wayne has been more than a large part of that. Uh, um, and it's a, uh, uh, well, it, it, it is a remarkable achievement. Can, can I ask before you open the public comment? Yep. So I actually put a plan of board because they're also active tonight on this. Do you have any questions for Matt? Or just, I mean, I've, this isn't to be disrespectful. I've, I've heard people's comments, and you're the ones who have to hear it. But do you have any questions for me before I leave? And... Great. Okay, I will slip out to them, and I'm sorry to okay. not say it the end. Thank, Thank you, Wayne. Anyway. Questions from the public or comments um, by the public? As you uh, I have tell, some comments. Will, before this comes up in any thorough way about hunting in particular, we will schedule public hearings. As, Five, six years ago, we had you know 150 people or so show up at the junior high community room, and we'll probably end up doing something like that again. So uh, it's not the only shot, but, but. So I hate to be the grain of sand that holds the big wheel back from progress, but I do have a couple issues with it. And probably my biggest issue. Can I state your name, please? My name's William Golaski. I live in the Florence section of Northampton. Is with the, and I'll say the definition of active recreation. So if you truthfully look active recreation up, it does include organized sports, playgrounds. It also includes motorized vehicles, hunting, fishing, hiking, that type of stuff. So I think we don't look at the full spectrum of active recreation. We're looking at a piece of it. And we're kind of forgetting about certain things in my mind. I'm an avid hunter, fisherman, snowmobile. I own an ATV. It's things that people may not like, 
but it's all legal stuff and I recreate in a nice way, I do it legally. I'm looking for places to do that. Um, part of the big problems with, I'll say the snowmobile ATV end of it is if you do not give people a place to recreate, they're just gonna go wherever and do whatever. And I'm against that. Mm -hmm. I follow the rules, I'm a law-abiding citizen, I pay registrations, I buy fishing license, which puts money into conservation. Um, so my big problem is that word active recreation. Um, I know it was, and I've been involved with this for a long time. Um, it was in the plan last time. I truthfully see no improvements in the last seven years. Um, we did open up a bow hunting area to hunting, and I'm not just gonna talk hunting here, but in the same instance, we took away our area. So basically that was a wash. Um, no new areas in the last seven years on active recreation. No new areas for snowmobilers, ATVs, fishermen, and women. So those are my concerns. Um, and I'm concerned about going into the next plan and with the hopes that something will happen and go through another seven years of no movement in that direction. You know, it has to be fair to all the citizens out of 147 pages, and I know, and I've read it, the majority, there's about 15 that are super pertinent. The single item that could not be decided was hunting, out of 147 pages. Mm, that might be a little bit of prejudice towards the hunters in my mind. Um, in the meetings, and some of the lands that were proposed, and, and I will quote this, but I won't say it's an exact quote, and this was from Wayne. One of the pieces was considered a tick infested jungle. We couldn't even get into that in the western part of town. If you can't get into the tick infested jungle, I don't have a lot of hopes down the road for getting into a nice piece of property. Um, so I just, you know, and, and we were looking at in the new plan, he did mention some new lands. It would have been 8% of the areas that were legal to hunt. You can probably take 75% of the land that the city owns and it's out of bounds because of rules and regulations in regards to hunting. So you're talking 8% of another, once again, very small percent. Um, and it's a thing I love to do and I, I'm a citizen here. I wanna be able to recreate here. You know, I'm here to stand up for myself and a lot of other people. Once again, and you folks know it, you get you know four days that the plan's coming out and they're approving it tonight. Not a lot of time to talk about it. I hope in the future, and, and you guys, I've worked with you guys in the past, some of you, and you know you guys have been um, gracious and we had good meetings and rapport. I hope that'll come down the road and hopefully we can change some things or hopefully some of the new planning will include that type of recreation, active recreation. And once again, if you look at the goals, it's probably three to four different times in those goals that active recreation is a concern. But where you're, you know, accurate recreation's this big and we tend to look at this much. We just need to broaden our horizon on that. That's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Any other comments? Jane Potter. Thank you, Keith. <laughs> Jane Potter. I'm with um, Meadow City Conservation Coalition, um, and I just I'm hoping to make a helpful contribution here. I think um, for those of us who went through this last time, these meetings get incredibly polarizing, and it turns into a hunting versus no hunting. And my hope is that we might be able to just accept the fact that the culture of guns. Um, and this is with all due respect to you, because you have to face this too, as as do the people who love hunting. You know, it, guns just freak people out these days, um, generally. I, I fully understand. I know you do, and I say this very respectfully. I mean, I think this is for everybody. Guns freak. Make sure to talk to the. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. Guns freak people out. We recently had the, you know, the lockdown at JFK. I think that people are very sensitive to this issue, and it's very polarizing. Um, it's just not the time of, you know, Grandpa being able to take his child out into the woods, unfortunately. So we just have to. I think that's a maybe a. A place to start the conversation that it's not necessarily hunting versus not hunting but you've got a gun problem in this country and people are really sensitive to it beyond that another point that I hope might be helpful is that um, we've never 
when we did this seven years ago, and I'm hoping we might do it now, we've never really expanded the conversation so that we not only hear the hunters, which, and you deserve to be heard, I'm trying to speak to you, but there are so many other constituents in town with this much open space, and Wayne has done an amazing job, you know, 25% of, of open space, but the schools would love to be able to use the land for Forest Fridays. The arts associations would love to be able to have art in the park like they do in East Hampton. Um, Bob's group has done things with children's literature um, writers, of whom we have many in this town, having workshops for kids. In the, there's so many different, the rec department would love to be able to sponsor more recreational apartments, uh, programs on these lands. The senior center would be able to, and we don't, we haven't expanded the conversation about open space to be able to include the many constituents in town who I think would love to be part of this discussion. So I'm hoping that's helpful, but I'd really love us to think of it as not just hunters versus non-hunters. This is, how can we, all of us in this city, use this amazing gift of open space? And I hope that can be part of the discussions going forward. Thank, Thank you. you. Sir, Bob. I, I would like to, uh, Bob Zimmerman, uh, I'd like to uh, support strongly what Jane said. I think there, in discussing the hunting issue, we tend to think of two polarized sides, the hunters and the non-hunters, or the anti-hunters, whatever you want to call them. And four years ago, um, during the public hearing, it really didn't, we didn't advance the issue at all because there were very strong talks, both pro-hunting and anti-hunting, and it didn't lead to uh, uh, much understanding, I think, on one side or the other. And I think there are many other, as Jane just said, there are many other stakeholders in the city who uh, have an interest in the conservation lands, and Jane mentioned them, schools, recreation, uh, disability, senior center. Uh, historic Commission, we're, uh, we're involved in uh, rehabilitating <coughs> part of the Beaverbrook Greenway that lies between Route 9 and the Beaverbrook. And um, we built a, a blind there, we have an informational kiosk, we're having um, picnic tables made, making trails and so forth for people to use, essentially an area for public recreation. And uh, we are talking uh, about a connection with the Historic Commission because the area that we're re rehabilitating was an old farm with an interesting history and um, when we have our grand opening sometime in the fall for this area um, we've talked very seriously about having it a uh, sort of a cooperative effort between the groups that did the work but the Historic um, Commission as well. So I, I think one has to bear in mind that um, there are many different stakeholders and it would be good if they were represented in some systematic way in the discussions um, that go further about the use of conservation areas. Thank you. Any other comments? So uh, the question on, uh, on the table is uh, whether or not to endorse the open space plan. Uh, and uh, there's no time frame um, uh, for any of the actions inside the plan, especially in, in hunting. Um, but it is in general support for the recommendations of the plan. Um, when we pursue hunting uh, as a question, um, we did a lot of re research last time it came up, talked to other communities who allow and who don't allow, what their experience has been. Uh, we looked, researched uh, uh, the legal framework, uh, current state laws, uh, we held public hearings, and I imagine we'll do all that again. Uh, a few weeks ago I asked that people be thinking on the commission about what what decision rules we might use, uh, what would be the principles uh, uh, that we would use as we discover um, information uh, in hearings or through our own research. And I will be at some point um, asking that we pool those thoughts um, and come up with a, uh, a list of um, 
decision principles that we use as we uh, investigate this. Uh, so that's all a process to come sometime in the future. Um, but for right now, the, the question is whether to endorse the plan as Wayne has summarized it. Is there a motion? I move to endorse the plan. Second. And the second. Further discussion? Comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So voted. Uh, we will uh, uh, at some point have to get down into the nitty gritty of hunting and I take seriously the recommendations that Bob and Jane have made that we make sure that it's not only limited to that. That will have to be uh, one focus, but thinking about how else there has been uh, uh, a group recently that came and asked Sarah and me for how might they propose art in the woods and uh, school trips and that sort of thing um, in, around the Mineral Hills area. This is the Friends of Mineral Hills group that was proposing that. So uh, it's a, a, a good suggestion. I think we should also um, take a look at active recreation. Uh, the gentleman's comments. Mm -hmm. what? You know, how much you're really uh, endorsing all of that. I, I can add that at the last two public hearings of the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife Board, uh, the extension of the archery bow season was discussed and approved, as well as the consideration of reducing the 500 feet set back to 150, which would significantly for, for increase mm -hmm. 250 for crossbows, similar to what New York did. So the, if you overlay that with the access and the density issue, you would significantly increase the potential areas that might be open to archery. So I guess my point being state regulations are not set in stone. They are also changing to the extent that we follow those. And I would might suggest inviting a state, some state biologists. We did last time, uh, the, uh, 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 some of the uh, fish and wildlife people who were responsible for identifying the carrying capacity of various species. Mm -hmm. so, so we will likely do that again. Um, Sarah, we have one more item, though. Uh, we had the request for an extension of the order of conditions for maintenance work throughout the city. Yes, so um, it seems like we just did this three years ago. So DCW came in three years ago with a much revised number of intent for maintenance work throughout the city. So uh, road paving and um, other types of activities. And yeah, and rather than redoing it again, because it has worked very well for for us and for DPW, they're requesting a three-year extension. And uh, they've talked about correcting also uh, an erroneous phrasing in the existing order? Yeah, it, was, it didn't seem significant enough to do an amendment, but just to write it down. Because the, 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 uh, remove the phrase land underwater because we're really talking about water and vegetative Yeah, so that's actually making it less restrictive, uh, more restrictive than the language. The other one. Any questions, comments from the commissioners? Do we want to make a motion to uh, extend that generic order of conditions with that uh, correction of phrase? Motion. And a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So voted. Anything else? So have you got anything for us to ratify, Sarah? Uh, I do not. Um, one FYI, there's a, uh, a NEPA filing for the reconstruction of Damon Road that will, it, it wasn't triggered by that was impacted roadway addition and uh, shade tree cutting that triggered the NEPA filing, uh, but that will be coming in. Okay. okay. Otherwise, we'll be uh, back here in two weeks. Sounds good. Motion to adjourn. So